Good evening, everybody. We're going to take a couple more minutes to let people keep wandering in, and then we'll be starting. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. We are so happy that you're here to share this evening with Jim Wallace. Now, before we get started, I'd like to um, acknowledge and thank our sponsors. Can we have that slide up? So our sponsors are MICA, which stands for Milwaukee Inner City Congregations Allied for Hope, um, and the We All Belong campaign. Also, Wisdom, which is the network, the statewide network that MICA is part of. Um, Boswell Books, which will be selling um, Jim's book after the uh, program. Um, Bay Bridge, Wisconsin, which is a Whitefish Bay social justice group. And then uh, the host of this church, my church, United Methodist Church of Whitefish Bay. And now I'd like to invite um, our pastor, um, Reverend Dr. Gary Holmes, just to give a short welcome. Well, thank you. What a blessing to welcome everyone. And, and just the turnout tells us how important the issue is. And we're so grateful that you're here. We pray that you're welcomed and um, know where the restrooms are and uh, feel comfortable and connecting and what a blessing to gather under this topic. Uh, so God bless you in uh, this time that we gather together. Now let me give you a brief rundown of what our program will be tonight. Um, so first, we want to take a few minutes to talk about um, a campaign that was actually inspired by Jim Wallace. So this campaign is called We All Belong and is working to raise awareness about the dangers of white Christian nationalism and to encourage voter engagement. Then we'll hear um, from Jim Wallace about why white Christian nationalism is such a danger to our democracy and our way of life and how we as people of faith and conscience um, can find a better path forward for ourselves and our nation. Now, Jim has written a book called The False White Prophet, um, so The False White Gospel, that offers a vision of what our nation can be, and he will share some thoughts from that book. Now, following Jim's presentation, there'll be an opportunity for you to ask, ask questions and delve a little deeper into some of the issues that he'll be raising. Now, we don't get Jim here every day, so don't be shy um, with your questions. Um, and after the program, there'll be a reception outside in the narthex with food. Um, and uh, you can also purchase um, Jim's book and have it signed by him. Um, and also get some information about white Christian nationalism as well. Um, there's several resources that um, the We All Belong campaign will provide for you. 
So I think we've already talked about where the restrooms are. Hopefully you can find them if you need them. And so now I'm going to invite Pastor Joe Jackson to come forward and give us the invocation. Good evening again. Let us pray. Holy God, Holy One, God of justice, God of peace, God of mercy, God of power, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this place. Thank you for this people. Thank you for this purpose. How good and pleasant it is for us to dwell together this evening in unity. We call on the movement of your precious Holy Spirit that it would speak to us, speak in us, and speak through us tonight. Use our speaker in a way, in a mighty way, like we know you will. Now bless us this evening. Bless us with your mercy, with your peace and your power. And let us leave here not only inspired, but convicted to do your will, your way, and your work. For it's in your holy name we pray, and all the people said, Amen. Thank you. And now I am pleased to invite Reverend Dr. Richard Shaw, who is a president of MICA, um, as well as Brenda Jackson, who is the chair of our voter engagement team of the We All Belong campaign, to talk a little bit about what the We All Belong campaign is. Thank you. I'm going to use this podium for just a moment. Good evening. It was on a hot day that fell between the short summer window, window here in Milwaukee, where over 100 faith leaders gathered on MLK Drive in front of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. statue and declared, we all belong. Here we are, nearly eight months later, still declaring, we all belong belong. The all, we all, the, the, the all we long, we all belong campaign is Micah's commitment to building the beloved community. The heartbeat of the drive and drive of this campaign is love. And when I think about the word love, I think about the word love that comes from the Greek word agapa, which is to esteem, to honor, to think highly of. It is troubling to know that here in 2024, we have to take special efforts to live out our existence in a community that embraces all cultures, all religions, all genders, all races, all ethnicities, all economic classes, and communities including the LGBTQIA communities. For God created all humanity in God's image. And if God can look at God's creation and say it is good, who are we to say that it's not? We also understand that there are those who desire to control politics and society. We must be sure to do three things. Protect our democracy, condemn white Christian nationalism, and be intentional in building the beloved community, the founding fathers of this country, never intended for us to have kings and demagogues, but to be a democracy of the people, for the people, by the people. Although we are represented here tonight with people from different faiths, as a Christian preacher, I can speak as a Christian and follower of Jesus, of the scripture. Jesus' ministry was about loving and embracing all. However, there are those who have misconstrued and misinterpreted both scripture and the Jesus in the scripture for political gain and control. Therefore, we must come together and denounce white Christian nationalism and embrace the freedom of religion and continue to proclaim the beloved community and that we all belong. The community is a community that is not exclusive, but it's inclusive. It is inclusive of all of God's creation, regardless of political affiliation, regardless of religious affiliation, 
The beloved community is one that is open to all, embraces all, as we see our way to building this beloved community. In closing, this July, the great city of Milwaukee will host the Republican National Convention. And we understand that white Christian nationalism crosses political lines, racial lines, gender lines, but we want to send a clear message that we all belong and that the We All Belong campaign is here to stand up for righteousness and stand against the unholy use of religion to suppress and oppress. So join us on July the 14th that in our We All Belong campaign will be hosting a major event that we hope you will be a part of it. We can send a message to the world that we all belong. Thank you. Good evening. Y'all alive? <laughs> we don't have to be so quiet. We all belong. Ain't no stopping us now. We're on the move. We got it. We know a folk with a negative vibe, and we know they only want to push us aside. But we ain't gonna let nothing Turn us around, turn us around, turn us around. We ain't, and I know ain't, gonna let nothing turn us away. We're gonna keep on walking. We're gonna keep on talking. We're gonna keep on praying. We're gonna keep on voting. Voting our value and valuing our vote. I'm gonna turn up and turn out. I ain't gonna let nobody turn me around. During the 1970s, the birds penned these words, turn, 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 to everything, turn, turn, turn. There is a season, turn, 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 and a time to every purpose under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to reap, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to lie, a time to weep, a time to vote, and always a time to belong, for we belong. Stevie Wonder penned the following words, God saved his world for women, men, boys, and girls, all peoples, all babies, all children, all colors, all races, all faith, the world's for you and the world's for me. This world, my world, your world, our world, everybody's world. This world was made for you and all humanity. Turn, turn, turn. Turn up, I say turn up, turn up. Turn out, turn out, turn out. For we all belong. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me around. Don't you let anyone turn you around. Preachers, where are you? It's time to turn up and turn out. Preacher wives, where are you? It's time to turn up and turn out. Parishioners, 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 where are you? It's time to turn up and turn out. Politicians, where are you? It's time to turn up and turn out. Whose turn is it? It's souls to the polls. It's families to the polls. It's power to the poll. It's 100 women on the move to the polls. I've just learned it's even Bay Bridge to the polls. Yes, it's our time. Whose time? It's Micah's time. Milwaukee Inner City Congregation's Ally for Hope. Where are you, Micah? Whose turn? Where are you, Wisdom? Yeah, it's Kush time, it's Rick's time, it's Esther's time, it's Joshua's time, it's Naomi's time, it's Moses' time. Social justice organizations in the state of Wisconsin, 
coming together, working together, and staying together. For we all belong, and together we are wisdom. Whose time? It's wisdom's time. It's our Muslim sisters' time. It's our Jewish brothers and sisters' times. It's our Christian brothers and sisters' times. Yes, we all belong. Yeah, and we're not going to zip James Jim Wallace. It's your time. It's your time to expound on America's original sin, racism, white privilege, and the bridge to America, God's politics, why the right gets it wrong and the left just see, don't seem to get it. Turn up and turn out, Jim Wallace, whether you are black, red, yellow, white, LGBT, poor to the richest, walking tall or in a wheelchair bound, social just and unjust, no matter who you are with all the isms, you belong. Who's time? Who's time? For we all belong. And now I'd like to invite Reverend Dennis Jacobson to introduce Jim Wallace. That was Brenda Valentine Jackson, by the way. <laughs> Married to Reverend Joseph Jackson, who is very contemplative, and she is a hurricane. <laughs> I have to also say you're not a great speaker, but you're a great organizer, because just a few weeks ago you brought together a hundred leaders of Black Baptist churches into a room to talk about get out the vote, right? Our time. Jim Wallace is a, yeah, really. Jim Wallace is a writer, teacher, preacher, and long haul social justice advocate whose life and actions are grounded in the liberating gospel of Jesus. He is a New York Times bestselling author, public theologian, preacher, and commentator in ethics and public life. Jim is the founding director of the Georgetown University Center on Faith and Justice and the inaugural holder of the chair in Faith and Justice. In 2022, Washingtonian magazine named Wallace one of the 500 most influential people shaping policy in D.C. Raised in a Midwestern evangelical family, as a teenager, Jim questioned the racial segregation in his church and community, which led him to the black churches and neighborhoods of inner city Detroit. He spent his student years involved in the civil rights and anti-war movements in Michigan State University. Jim is the founder of Sojourners, the host of the popular podcast, The Soul of the Nation, and the author of 13 books, including America's Original Sin, Racism, White Privilege, and the Bridge to America, God's Politics, Where the Right Gets It Wrong and the Left Doesn't Get It, and released just a few days ago, and in the back, and I hope everybody leaves with a copy of this new book today, The False White Gospel, rejecting Christian nationalism, reclaiming true faith, and refounding democracy. Jim served on President Obama's White House Advisory Council on Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships, and has taught faith and public life courses at Harvard and Georgetown University. He also serves as a research fellow at the Georgetown University Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs. Jim, we first connected about 45 years ago through our mutual friend, Father Daniel Berrigan, and our joint efforts against nuclear weapons. That connection was renewed now and then when the justice efforts of Gamaliel, the national training network for MICA and Wisdom Affiliates and Sojourners intersected. And I had the privilege of working with you. In the summer of 2022, we connected again this time in sustained struggle against white Christian nationalism involving Gamaliel and your national leadership. Your presentation on white Christian nationalism at Gamaliel's Race and Power in America Summit in December 2022 led 
the Gamaliel National Religious Leaders Caucus to issue its call to the beloved community in rejection of white Christian nationalism. And it inspired the MICA Religious Leaders Caucus to launch our We All Belong campaign. Your being here this evening is another indicator of your interest in connecting national level strategies with grassroots organizing. This has been your attempted methodology since you founded the Sojourners community almost 55 years ago. Jim, my experience of you is that you bring a pastoral presence to political struggle, a relationality to issues, a collaborative spirit, and a passionate dedication to the way of Jesus in a time when the gospel is met with indifference, or worse yet, distortion and perversion by white Christian nationalism. I feel a spiritual affinity to you. I think we both recognize, as so many people of faith do, as people in this church do tonight, that we are indeed sojourners in a strange land. Jim Wallace. My, my, my. So I want to just continue the sermon begun by Brenda Jackson. I'm going to call you Bishop Brenda tonight. So I'm grateful. I just feel a lot of gratitude tonight for what's already happening in Milwaukee. We had a great time this afternoon with all these wonderful activists from MICA, We Belong, and, and all of you are going to be needed in Milwaukee, all of you. Let's talk about that. This book is full of texts. Let's begin with the first book of the Bible. First chapter. Now, we're surrounded by political noise all the time, right? Do you feel that? <laughs> Just surrounded by noise. Now, part of my vocation is to listen to the noise and try and discern the times, offer perspective. But it's hard, isn't it, to listen to all the noise? So I have all that noise around me in my head when I go to that first chapter of Genesis. It starts with a phrase I love. With all the noise, then God said, shut up. <laughs> Be quiet. Then God said, what did God say? Let us create humankind all humankind in our own image after our own likeness we all belong there's our text we all belong but in the beginning of the United States even before we were founded as a nation people from White European countries came, eradicated indigenous people to steal their land, kidnapped Africans into a brutal chattel slavery to provide free labor. It was called the slaveholding republic, because you can't call it a slaveholding democracy, can you? In the beginning. So white Christian nationalism is not new. It goes back a long way to a doctrine of discovery against indigenous people. To this, this racial hierarchy from the beginning of our nation. In fact, the name spells the problem the most inclusive, welcoming, inviting message 
in the world, they make it white. They say Christian, but they don't mean love and sacrifice and service. They mean control, domination. It's the old dominionist theology. I see my brother pastors here. You know that theology. It's an old one. And nationalist. Now, I'm getting up in years. It's true. Um, and I wasn't there at the ascension of Christ. <laughs> but I read about it. And we got a great commission, right? Telling us believers to go into all the world to make disciples in every nation, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. All the world. Nationalism? Really? So let's name some stuff. White Christian nationalism is an idolatry. It's an idol, an idolatry, the worship of a nation. Now we have a former president hawking Bibles <laughs> for 70 bucks a piece with the documents of one nation on the inside and a title, the title of the Bible, the Trump Bible, is what? God bless the USA. Cover the Bible. That's idolatry. Yeah. 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 Another word we like to stay away from is heresy. Heresy is just drawing Christians away from Christ. It's always what it's meant. This message is a heresy. It's a sacrilege. And yet, we're not just tonight denouncing an idolatry and a heresy. We want to offer what the way forward is. This book is an Easter book of resistance and hope at the same time. Resistance and hope at the same time. Every nation has its better angels and its worst demons, right? The racial demons of this country run very, very deep. And we have a candidate running for president who is a good marketer. He's marketing racial grievance, to be sure, but it goes deeper than that. He's marketing the worst demons of American life. So it won't be enough to go up against that with politics. We've got to go deeper here. That's why what's happening in this beautiful city, which I love, uh, is so important because we're talking about a theology of democracy, a spirituality of democracy. We're facing a test, a test in these next few months, a test in these times ahead. The Bible has two kinds of times, chronos time, tick tock, tick tock, and kairos time. A kairos moment is when time is changed, a time which makes everything different. It affects everything else. We are, my brothers and sisters, in a Kairos time, a Kairos time, which could change so many other things, a Kairos time. So it's a test of democracy, to be sure, biggest one in my lifetime, biggest one since the Civil War. It's also a test of faith, and the media doesn't talk much about that. They're talking now test of democracy, which is good, but it's a test of faith. There's a third test going on here, too. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Back there? Okay. It's a test of a new generation. I teach 
young, I can I always call them kids, they're students. All the time. Best part of my week. The new generation is watching. Watching us. To see where the faith community will come down at this critical moment in history. Will we stand up? Will we turn up? Turn out? What will we say? What will we do? They're watching us. And if we don't come down on the side of true faith over bad religion, white Christian nationalism is bad religion. Now some people think the answer to bad religion is no religion. I got colleagues on my left who say that all the time. They're wrong. The answer to bad religion is good faith. Better faith. Better faith. And that's what we can do. I think the faith factor in this election is going to be decisive. The faith factor. We can't let white Christian nationalism become the faith factor in this election. We've got to take these biblical texts. I mean, these are texts that I know, you know, and I just wrestled with them all over again. I did all the commentaries again, new commentaries. I searched, I struggled, I wrestled, I prayed over these texts, and I found in these old ancient texts some new things. Some things that can refresh and reframe them for what they mean right now. So if we take Genesis seriously, this divine foundation for all of our earthly talk about human rights and voting rights. Here's what it means. It means to try and suppress, subvert, not count a vote because of someone's color of skin or anything else is nothing less than an assault on the Mago Day. Get that straight. An assault on the Mago Day. We're talking, Barbara Williams Skinner and I are talking to a lot of secretaries of state these days, faith leaders, about their processes, their procedures, how fair it's going to be. Uh, some are very willing to talk, others have to be talked into it. When I was talking to one of them recently, uh, we won't name his name, but I said, you're a Christian, right? Oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. Oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. You know this text in Genesis? Oh, yeah, I know that text. How would you apply God making us all in the image of God, making all the voters in your state in the image of God? How do you apply that text to voting rights? Never thought about that. We talked for an hour and a half to think about that. So that text just lays it out for me in a fundamental way. And then there's this, don't you love the Good Samaritan text? I mean, the Good Samaritan text can help lead us to a multiracial democracy. Here's what I mean by that. So this lawyer comes to Jesus to ask a question. What do I do? to inherit eternal life. Jesus says, well, you know the answer to that. You love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and your neighbor as yourself. You know that. He says, yeah, yeah. Then he says, who is my neighbor? Now this in the text, it's a Washington lawyer. <laughs> I know that tone of voice. It's not who's my neighbor, let me welcome. It's exactly who is my neighbor. Who am I obligated to? So Jesus uses this example of a Samaritan. Now, to the Judean audience to whom he was speaking, there were no good Samaritans. They were half-breeds, mixed race, false worshipers. They were trouble. They were a danger. They were, well, they were in in cartels with drugs and rapists coming to 
from Mexico. No, no, that's the other people. They were othered by the Judeans. Othered. And here is an other walking down the road, and Jewish scholars tell us the man by the side of the road was a Jew. And two of his leaders passed by, too busy. Vestry meetings or something. <laughs> Whatever reason, they, they, they didn't stop. But the Samaritan stops. This is an other helping one who's other to him. Yeah. Think about that. An other, so that means your neighbor might not live in your neighborhood. The Good Samaritan teaches us who our neighbor is. And he, this Samaritan, could lead us to a multiracial democracy. Now, white Christian nationalism is not going to give up easily. America's original sin has evolved over time, renewed itself again and again. And there now, it is now fighting for its life by any means necessary. That's what we're up against right now. And if we, if we make this fight and win this fight, we could, for the first time, offer the world the first genuinely multiracial democracy in the whole world. That's the moment we're in. So those who are fighting us on this, their strategy can be picked up in one sentence. Listen carefully now. They want to prevent our changing demography from changing our democracy. Say it again. They can't change. They can't stop our changing demography. But they want to prevent that from changing who has a voice, who is sharing power, who belongs, and who will reshape what democracy is. That's what they want to do. So that's what we're up against. And in particular, I love when Jesus says in John, you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you what? Free. Huh. The truth will make you free. It doesn't say you'll know the truth and you'll lie less. <laughs> the opposite of truth is captivity. Captivity. We are facing a whole lot of people, a lot of people in our white churches who are captive. They're oblivious, they're confused, and they're captive. Truth and freedom are indivisible. And so we're not just saying, lie less now that that president lied 37,000 times if you're counting. <laughs> but it's deeper than that. So when Jesus is having the debate with Pontius Pilate, about the truth on his day of crucifixion. Here's Pontius Pilate, the Roman emperor, the strong man, and he's losing the debate with Jesus. When he saw he was losing, he said, oh, what is truth? Wash his hands and kill Jesus. What is truth? Strong men always do that. They want to undermine the very idea of the truth. They want to say, there is no truth. So believe me, and I'll tell you the truth. Right? We're up against a nation. I'm going all over the country in these two weeks. And we live in a nation that is existing in parallel universes of information, of facts. They say alternative facts. They say fake news. And so people are not even hearing and seeing the same things. So how do we find the truth and speak the truth in our time? That may be the toughest question in this battle for democracy. You'll know the truth, the truth will make you free. Then there's that 
wonderful Galatians text, 328. It says, there's no longer Jew or Gentile, bond or free, male or female, because all are one in Christ Jesus. What I learned in studying this text is that this was a baptismal formula in the early church. This was the text they read at every single baptism. Imagine this now. Here are these early believers saying, yeah, we, we follow this, this brown-skinned Palestinian rabbi <laughs> who's taught us that we've got to overcome you have a, what, a handheld mic? Right? This thing keeps falling off. How's that? <laughs> so, we follow this Jesus who has told us to break down the barriers. <laughs> the three barriers in that text, always the pillars of division and violence and hate, race, class, and gender. So they're saying, so we're not perfect. We often make mistakes, but we are committed to breaking down, overcoming those barriers. That's who we are. That's what we do. It's not extracurricular for us. It's vocational for us. And they're saying, in effect, if you don't want to be a part of that kind of community, you better go somewhere else. Imagine if that text was used at every American baptism. My, my, my. You know that text I learned also? Galatians 3.28 was removed from every slaveholder Bible. At Fisk University, they have all these slaveholder Bibles. You can't find that text in any of those Bibles. And then, in the Beatitudes, Jesus says, blessed are the peace lovers. Is that it? We, we all love peace. You know, we all love it. Or, or maybe he said, blessed are the peacekeepers. In an unjust status quo, they just kind of keep things going. No, he said, blessed are the peacemakers. And listen to what he says. Because they'll be called the children of God. What a distinction. Blessed are the conflict resolvers, is what he's saying there. I talk to students all the time. A whole generation now is moving into the world of conflict resolution. It's an art and a science at the same time. And, and our politics are on a trajectory produced by, I, I know I'm in a church, I don't be partisan. Donald Trump has produced a trajectory of fear to hate to violence. That's now our trajectory in politics. So how do we confront that religiously and not just politically? So blessed are the peacemakers. Uh, peacemakers are what we most don't hear from in our politics or even in our churches. We're afraid. A lot of pastors I talk to, uh, they're afraid of saying anything. I'm particularly talking about some white, liberal, moderate type pastors who might have a Black Lives Matter sign on their front lawn. When it comes to talking about these texts in the pulpit, with an election coming up, they're afraid the emails will come back, you're doing politics. You're doing politics. And they're afraid. Some are getting death threats from their congregants or people in the community. We've got to give pastors something to preach in this election season. We've got to ask them to be the truth tellers and the peacemakers that they're supposed to be. And in particular, 
It can't just be black pastors telling white pastors what they should say. You get tired of that, don't you, brothers? <laughs> white people, white pastors, have to tell their white pastors what they need to say. And then there's that text. It was actually my conversion text. I was in the movement, uh, a young man, and I had been kicked out of my little evangelical church in Detroit as a teenager over the issues of race and poverty and war. So I was secular. I want nothing more to do with that. In fact, I remember an elder took me aside one night from my little church, and he knew I was making these trips to the city, showing up at black churches and being taken in with my naive white boy questions, patiently uh, answering them, taking jobs alongside young men in Detroit who were black and I was white. And I was trying to figure out why I'm listening to my city now, a teenage kid. Black Detroit and white Detroit are really different. Why is that? Nobody in my white church and school and neighborhood would, would answer the question. They wouldn't answer any questions. The only honest answer goes, if you keep asking those questions, son, you're going to get into a lot of trouble. And that proved to be true. <laughs> so I tell my students, trust your questions and follow them to wherever they take you to get them answered. So, so I went in to the city to try to find answers to those questions. And we're not talking to each other. Here's a little statistic, sad one. Today, in this time after the Obama presidency and all the rest, 75% of white people have not one person or family of color in their inner social circle. We're not proximate to each other. That's not an accident. My dad comes home from World War II out in the Pacific, and all the GIs like my dad got a FHA loan to buy a house, a GI bill to pay for education. My family got made middle class housing and education by my government, biggest affirmative action program in the history of the country. No black sailors got that. No black GIs got that. Had they not, had they got that, I wouldn't have grown up in a white church, a white school, a white neighborhood. This was deliberate racial geography, racializing geography. That's why we're so split up, because they're afraid if we ever got to know each other and talked, moms and dads bonding over their kids their hopes, their fears, their dreams, their health. They don't want that. So we have to do that. So we had a hate summit at the White House that I was a part of. And there was a militia guy who had come out of uh, Proud Boys, I think. And he told me afterwards, when I was in that alley smoking weed, because my parents were gone all the time, I was alone all the time, the guy that came down the alley talking, he, he didn't give me ideology. That wouldn't have worked. He talked to me about being part of a group. <coughs> Purpose, meaning, community. I didn't have that. He offered that. So I quote Rachel Kleinfeld in the book. She's the best expert on political violence we have. And she said, the faith community has such a role to play here because aren't we the ones who are supposed to offer belonging to people? The answer to the political violence isn't just to stop it, I'm all for that, but we've got to offer belonging to people who've got nowhere to belong. So we're going deeper here than just the politics. But that text, when I was in the student movement, I was reading, you know, I was reading Karl Marx, Ho Chi Minh, and Che Guevara, but they weren't satisfying. And though I was secular, had left my church, 
I couldn't quite get shed of Jesus. So I went back, and I found this text in the 25th chapter of Matthew. This is the it was me text. I was hungry. I was at mom working three jobs who still needed food stamps. That was me. I was thirsty. I was naked. I was a stranger. Stranger in the text means immigrant. That's what the word means, right? So I was that family who in Guatemala couldn't grow food in their land anymore because of climate change. Packed up all their belongings. Walked thousands of miles because the U.S. would let them in, they were told. Then got put in cages, separated from their children who got deported. Jesus says, that was me in the cage. I was sick. I, I didn't have health care. Uh, I was in prison. I was, I was uh, one of those young black men who was incarcerated. That was me. And they say, Lord, Lord, when did we see you hungry and thirsty and naked and sick and in prison? We didn't know it was you. Had we known it was you, we would have just at least formed a social action committee or something. <laughs> he says, no, as you've done to the least of these, you've done to me. That's the economics of Jesus, which turns our politics completely upside down. We took that text into the Congress last week to talk about the child tax credit, CTC, that over, overcame child poverty more than anything else, and they didn't renew it, didn't revive it. So we're using Matthew 25 in the halls of Congress, talking to Republicans and Democrats alike. So these are the texts, and so uh, someone asked me the other day, they said, well, I was in Mississippi, I was in a white church, and I knew those texts, I and mean, I grew up with them, and, and I never thought of them in relationship to any of this. I said, yeah, well, uh, let's be blunt here. The word white evangelical, the most important word in the phrase, is not evangelical, it's white. White Christianity, that phrase, it's an idolatry. Let's put the Christian back into the phrase and overcome the white, which is an idol. Whiteness is an idol that we need to be set free from. So I've already learned in these three days in this book tour, and you're an example of this, there is a hunger out there for a different kind of religious word, for a different kind of faith. It's, it's, it's a hunger that people are feeling uncomfortable and confused, not knowing what to say and how to say it. All this book is, is a tool. I, I said, and I'll show you that, this is my two cents, that's all, my two cents. I want this to awaken to two cents in everyone who reads it to do their two cents, because I believe in a God who multiplies the value of our two cents. Right? Yeah. So, let me be bold enough to say the faith factor in the coming weeks and months could be decisive for this next election. Decisive. I can't control the politics. I can't predict the politics. I can't calculate whether how racial grievance will do in Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Georgia. I don't know. Or how much our worst demons will win at the polling place. I can't control that. But I can decide what I'm going to do, what I'm going to say, what we're going to choose. We've got choices to make. And I'll close with it with this, and we can do some questions back and forth. Uh, in our meeting today, one of the brothers was saying, the word optimism came up, right? Uh, 
And I said, my new chair at Georgetown is named after one of my dearest mentors and friends. It's called the Archbishop Desmond Tutu Chair of Faith and Justice at Georgetown. And he taught me the difference between optimism and hope. Optimism, he taught me, is, is a, it's a feeling. It's a mood. It's a personality type, cup half empty, cup half full, all that. He said, well, optimism is a feeling. Hope is a choice, a decision you make. Because of this thing we call faith. Now faith is the substance, right, of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. My best paraphrase of that Hebrews text is hope means believing in spite of the evidence, then watching the evidence change. Right? So one, one story about Desmond Tutu, and we'll finish this, this, this part. So I was invited to South Africa by South African churches when there wasn't much of a relationship between their churches and our churches. To try to forge a bond and strategy came up with the sanctions movement that brought down Pretoria. And I was on all their security lists, so I had to be snuck into the country by World Vision, who, whose pastors weren't checked. <laughs> they made me a visiting pastor. So I, I couldn't get met at the airport by my friends, so I got to go to St. George's Cathedral in the heart of Cape Town, Desmond Tutu's place of worship. They canceled a rally. So the bishop said, okay, we're going to have church. Try and cancel that. So there he was in the pulpit. I just snuck in through hundreds of military police. Weapons outside surrounding the cathedral. I snuck through and sat with my friends and I watched him. And he starts to preach. And then the doors, cathedral doors were broken open by South African security police. These guys are thugs. They line the walls of his cathedral with tape recorders and pads in their hands saying, you just got out of prison, go ahead, be prophetic. We'll get it down, that's what I felt them saying. We'll get it down. And they were saying, I thought, you know, we own this country. We own this church. We own you. We own your God. And Desmond Tutu just stops speaking and bows his head in prayer. Little man, long, flowing robes. Looks a little bit like Yoda, you know. <laughs> He's quiet for a while. And we're terrified. What's going to happen? What's he going to say? He looks up and he smiles that signature Desmond Tutu smile. He says, you, you are powerful, very powerful, but I serve a God who will not be mocked. I serve a God who will not be mocked. Then he begins bouncing like a good black Baptist preacher. <laughs> and he says, so, since you've already lost, since you, he's surrounded by them, inside and outside. Since you've already lost, we invite you today to come and join the winning side. <laughs> and young people began dancing. It's called the toy toy, it's a protest dance. And we just followed the young people out. And, and all these soldiers didn't know what to do with dancing worshipers who weren't afraid. 10 years later, I met the inauguration of Nelson Mandela. Guess who's the master of ceremonies? Archbishop Desmond Tutu. And I said, Bishop, do you remember that day in St. George's? He smiled, he remembered. I said, today, they've all joined the winning side. You couldn't find anybody in South Africa on that day who wasn't always against apartheid, right? right? And, and what he taught me was the trajectory of faith for us, which is this. Faith produces hope, which makes action and makes change. 
faith, hope, action, and change. He taught me my theology of hope. And you know what? It was a wonderful day where 150,000 South Africans hearing Nelson Mandela announce a new nation. But you know, we're not so much needed at the celebration, at the party. We're needed back there in St. George's. When we feel surrounded, we're surrounded by all these bad forces. And you can only see the party through the eyes of faith. We're needed back there at St. George's to believe despite the evidence and then watch the evidence change. So what that says to me now, we're surrounded by these white Christian nationalists, Trump selling Bibles, talking about a Trump church, seeing he's being persecuted like Jesus, and he's saying, I'm being indicted for you. You know, that's ugly bad faith. But that's not gonna win. That's not gonna win. And we gotta believe back here at St. George is surrounded that we're gonna get to the party and the celebration. We're gonna get to multiracial democracy because we believe in it. Yeah. We, 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 we believe in it. So I wanna say, don't let them surround you or surround us in these days. Every one of us is an influencer. Family, friends, churches, congregations, every one of us has influence. It's time, as our sister told us, to turn up, turn out, show up, stand up, say what we believe, then act on what we believe, put our prayers into action. John Lewis says, your feet gotta do the walking and the praying. So what's happening here in Milwaukee and Wisconsin will make a difference. When the publisher said, where do you want to go on the book tour, they didn't expect me to say, Wisconsin, Michigan, Georgia, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. So don't, and they want you to become cynical. Cynicism, skepticism, withdrawal. The powers that be want to make us cynical, so we withdraw. Don't do that. It's time for all of us to stand up and speak out. And you got a campaign here. We all belong. Mike, you got a campaign to join here. Every one of you is needed for these next few months and for the new situation that we're gonna find ourselves in. So I want you to believe tonight, surrounded as you are and feel, we are on the winning side! Thank you very much. What do you say? Wow. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, a lot of food for thought. So now it's your turn um, to ask what questions might come to mind. And I do have some helpers um, who are going to pass the mic around if you just raise your hand. Um, helpers? <laughs> okay, great. So um, I'm just going to sit here and I'm going to ask the first couple questions while you think about what your questions will be. Um, and then we'll keep going from there. Okay, so my first question is, why do Christian people embrace white Christian nationalism, and how do they reconcile this ideology with the teachings of Jesus? I got asked in Florida last week, in a church setting like this, by the pastor, um, why can't Christians talk about race? I said, they can, just white Christians can. <laughs> so this goes back to our captivity. We're defined by the wrong word in the phrase white Christian. 
And that we can come together on. And I'm, I'm eager to go around the country and talk to people on different sides of the political aisle. And I want to bring these texts to bear and say, do we believe these or not? Here's what Jesus said. What did he mean? What does it mean for us right now? So there's nothing new in the white captivity of many Christian churches. This could be a time to break it wide open. Eddie Claude wrote the foreword to the book, and I love it. He was on with me on Morning Joe, our big launch on Tuesday at the table. And I quote him in the book as saying, everything is collapsing and everything is possible at the same time. We're in one of those moments, let's be clear. We're not just interested in saving democracy. Democracy needs to be transformed. Transformed. <laughs> but in order to transform democracy, you've got to save what is there and transform it. If we are winning this battle, I don't want to go back to democracy as usual after this election even if democracy wins this battle. We can't go back to democracy as usual. We've got to commit ourselves to transforming democracy. We talk about this amazing word, the beloved community, which came to us from all of our civil rights leaders. The beloved community is the foundation for a multiracial democracy. And that's what we all belong is all about. Listen to what they said. Listen to, uh, I got the, here it is. This was on your seat. Uh, updates and calls for the We All Belong campaign. Return this envelope. Return this envelope. It's got donations. I'm donating tonight to it, so you should too. So join the campaign. Don't just feel encouraged or inspired by an event, let's get to work. And I think if we put our faith into action, there's no telling how much could change after this election. So we're in this to break that captivity. And it's, it's a captivity that is making people unhappy, miserable. They're, they're, I want to set people free from this white captivity. And it's gotta be wanting yourself to be free, not just say, you're wrong and I'm right. That won't work. How do we help set people free? But I'll say one, this is controversial, but I'll say it. Every movement has to figure out who they can persuade and who they must defeat. Think about that. I mean non-violently but I mean at the ballot box. If I didn't think there were persuadable people, even in white churches, I wouldn't have written the book. But I think there are, and we're gonna go after them. But there are militant, religious, political power seekers that have to be defeated at the ballot box in Wisconsin. Okay, I'm gonna ask one more question and then open it up to the audience. So what do you say to people who ask, what is so wrong with wanting Christian values to be reflected in our government policies? Oh, I, I agree with that. I want Christian values to be reflected. Um, this, I believe in the separation of church and state. That doesn't mean the segregation of Christian values from public life, right? Let's get that clear. And Dr. King said to us, he reminded us, he, he said the churches, now he would say faith communities, must not be the master of the state or the servant of the state, but the conscience of the state. Okay? So how do we get back to that place? And I wanna talk about the values. Um, uh, what, what does it mean to prioritize the most marginal and the poorest? 
nations, all the Hebrew prophets said, kings, rulers, all those people, they'll be judged not by their gross national product, not by their military firepower, nor by their culture being the envy of the world. They'll be judged by how the poorest and most marginal are doing in their country. That's, that's, that's the biblical text, biblical test of rulers. So let's go back. I want to go back to the Bible. <laughs> and I want to have that d d debate. And uh, in, our, in our work in these 10 states we're in, we have a lot of black clergy are our leads in those states. We're going tomorrow to Detroit. Uh, but imams are joining us. Rabbis are joining us. We even got some white Christians joining us. <laughs> so, so, so I think we got to put our faith forward here and not be overwhelmed by the bad faith all around, but put our faith forward in the weeks and months going. And you've got a campaign doing that right here in Milwaukee and Wisconsin. So I, I think, uh, you know, I think that what's happening in my home state next door, Michigan and here, uh, I'll be in Grand Rapids. Grand Rapids isn't usually a stop on a book tour, you know? Uh, we'll be there a Sunday night. So, but have confidence in your faith to put your faith forward. That's really all I'm asking. Okay, are there any questions from the audience? I see a hand being raised. Several hands being raised, but. Thank you. This has been an exciting opportunity to listen to you. Um, interwoven in what you said was really the importance of conversation. And I'd like you to talk a little bit more. Uh, a, lo a lot of politics is, gee, I have this opinion, and you know, I'm trying to work it out. There is not as much emphasis on talking to our neighbors. Um, and I think where the action is, is, is talking to each other. Could you speak to that? You know, Brittany Packnett, who's a wonderful activist on policing and so many things. She's at Georgetown just last week. And it was the week where my class studies policing. <laughs> and they're reading Brittany Packnett. So they got to hang out with Brittany for a while. And, um, and she says, she said, uh, about solidarity. She said, if some of you want to join us in the streets, she was a Ferguson leader uh, in the streets. I met her in the streets of Ferguson. If you want to join us in the streets with, with rubber bullets, tear gas, uh, not knowing whether they're going to survive the night, you're welcome to join us. But you know, white people need to take maybe a deeper risk and talk to their friends and family and congregations. Talk to each other. That's, I, we have a big, every fall we have in my class a big discussion about how to deal with Thanksgiving dinner <laughs> when they all go home. You know. And, and uh, it's, a big, it's a big issue for a lot of my students. Uh, and we gotta say, it's not like, Dad, Mom, you're wrong and I'm right. It's, here is how I'm coming to faith. Here's what my faith is meaning for me. Here are these texts, and most parents wanna know what their kids are thinking, you know? And what are the common ground? in common spaces. And two of them are common faith. And another one is that all of our children matter. All of our children matter. So I think those conversations, my brother, are what we need to do, uh, show up again in your congregations, your Bible study groups, your family gatherings. Uh, most everybody here knows people who are caught up in white Christian nationalism, right? How do we speak to them and don't let them write it off as politics? This is about what faith means right now. 
We got to have that conversation. We got to not put politics aside if it means putting the teaching of Jesus aside. That's what we have to bring. Let Jesus do the talking. <laughs> can you hear me? Uh, I'm wondering how you can integrate into your general analysis of fighting for a true multiracial democracy, the U.S. imperial project of which the situation in Gaza and the parent genocide is in the forefront. Yeah. Yeah. How, how do you put all that together? Thank you. Gaza is breaking our hearts. Uh, and a whole lot of young people at Georgetown and everywhere are feeling it very deeply. Um, and this is a fundamental failure in U.S. foreign policy that goes back a very long time, long before October 7 and the brutality of Hamas, which was unspeakable. And yet what's happening now to countless people in Gaza, women and children, are facing famine and now food aid workers are being killed. I, I say everything I can when I have a chance to the people who are making those policies. They have to change. And, and I'll just say, the only way to change the policies of a right-wing government in Israel is to leverage the influence and aid that the U.S. has. Yeah. We've got to say, without mass, without a ceasefire, mass of humanitarian aid, and a commitment to a genuine, just, two-state solution, they should no longer get our military help. But we're also facing a lot of young people. I'm from Detroit. We have the largest Arab population uh, in Detroit of any city around the country, and people are feeling like, I, I just can't, I, I can only vote on this because they're watching, Palestinians are watching Al Jazeera every day and seeing babies dying. And they're connected to those families. It's very personal. In my classes, I have progressive Jewish women who believe all the right stuff, all the things I believe about what needs to happen, and Palestinian women in the same class. And we were able last fall to talk together in the classroom because the deep sorrows on both sides are not connecting. And the deep truths that apply to both sides are not being felt together. It's almost an impossible conversation on college campuses. My president, Jack DeJoya, tells me that. Uh, so that is the kind of thing that could just uh, impact, skew, distort this election. It's very possible. That's why when I say we're facing demons and angels, uh, or as someone said here earlier, evil. In this election, I, I feel evil encroaching. God's example. It's horribly e evil, and yet the mistake we've made in the past uh, is coming back to hurt so many people in our own body politic. That's the encroachment of evil, I think, right? So the best way to approach that is the kind of faith that takes evil seriously, speaks to it honestly. A lot of black pastors have spoken very clearly in need for a ceasefire and a two-state solution. And I want to say, I. I was, I've been over there many times in recent years, and um, uh, you know, I remember once, uh, right after South Africa, right after we had the big victory in South Africa, I was in Jerusalem speaking to a peace conference, uh, uh, Jewish peacemakers and Palestinian peacemakers. And they said, couldn't we do what we did, what you did in South Africa, couldn't we? Do they hear? I said, well, uh, when you don't have a Mandela or a de Klerk, it's hard to know how this is going to happen. We have a leadership crisis on both sides here. 
and that has to be finally overcome. But, but I've confessed in columns recently that as somebody who has been in favor, an advocate for a two-state solution for a long time, people like me haven't done enough to make that happen. We've let that languish. We're for it, not happening, and we let it languish. And this is the consequence of letting, letting justice languish, right? So how do we message, how do we talk about this? Accepting what's wrong, but then saying, how do we move forward here? And it won't be fixed by the election, but it's an issue that we're gonna have to deal with in places like my hometown of Detroit. So it's a huge issue that we have to take seriously. I don't have a question, I have a comment. Um, I'm over here, hi. Hi. Oh, there you are. Over here. Um, I want to point us back to the woman in scripture who reminded Jesus that he wasn't a nationalist and that we all belong. The Syrophoenician woman, the second unnamed woman in the Gospel of Mark. Before Jesus met her, he fed a multitude on the Jewish side of the lake. After Jesus met her, he fed a multitude on the Gentile side of the lake. He got the message. Say more about that. Say more about your interpretation of that, of that text. Um, the Gospel of Mark has yeah. three unnamed women in it. Yeah. The woman with the 12-year flow of blood. Yeah. The Syrophoenician woman who says, even the puppies eat the food under the table mm -hmm. to Jesus. After he says, I came only for my folks. I'm a nationalist. No, you're not. There's enough for everyone. Yeah, yeah. See, if we can get conversation about the text going in these days, that is, it's not just about uh, voter registration. Like in Ohio, we've learned that they purge now 6,000 voters from the rolls in Ohio, almost all black voters. So black churches now in Ohio are on Sundays in church uh, explaining, here's how you can find out if you're registered to vote. Now, not, I mean, but before November now. And I'm for all that, but we've got to talk about the text going deeper and deeper and deeper. So this is the conversation. I get, I'll tell you, if we get a conversation about biblical texts going in this electoral campaign, that could make a great different difference. So it isn't just stuff we're doing, but conversations we need to have like, like this here. Hi. Um, in the 1920s and 30s, uh, there was a new social media that was out called the radio. <laughs> and in Germany at that time, the Nazi party wanted to make sure that everybody had one. Of course, it was tuned to the Nazi channel. Um, in 1948, uh, in America, we decided to have something called the Fairness Doctrine. Where, where, where are you? I can't see you. Up here. Up here. Balcony. Up there. Up here. Okay. Up here. Got it. Um, we decided to have something called the Fairness Doctrine, which basically meant if you're going to have an opinion for 20 minutes on one side of the political spectrum, you had to have an opinion on the other side of the political spectrum. It was basically an FCC policy. In about 1980, Ronald Reagan said he would not enforce it anymore. And that's when we had the start of like Rush Limbaugh and some of the other shock jocks and right-wing radio start up. Right. What is your position on the possibility of bringing the Fairness Doctrine back? Uh, well, you'll be surprised to know I talk about the Fairness Doctrine in this book <laughs> and how Reagan abolished it. And that was the beginning of the polarization. But it's also been, been deeply influenced by the internet, uh, by social media, by people saying things on social media they wouldn't say to people face to face. And it's so ugly out there. I've had some social media response to this book over the last three, three days. <laughs> so we're deeply polarized. Uh, and I remember when I was growing up, I'm old enough to remember 
the evening news with Walter Cronkite. And we watched it for a half an hour after dinner every night. Only a half an hour of news every day, which was really nice, you know. And he said at the end, that's the way it is. He was the most trusted man in America at that moment. Now, you didn't always agree with him. There was bias. Clearly, this was still a white news network, so they missed a whole lot of stuff in the black community. But, but we don't have any more. The media is a town meeting, and now it's no longer a town meeting. And so it's all these websites and conspiracy theories and cable news and the radio you're talking about. So the media itself is part of the problem now. So there's a whole, I struggle with that in this book, a whole chapter on how to find the truth, where to find the truth, how to speak the truth, how to know the truth, and how to get set free by that. So uh, the Fairness Doctrine was the end of an attempt at being balanced, uh, and we've just been so polarized ever since. So we're in a battle here uh, with social media per se for what our messaging is. How do we message about the truth? How do we help people find the truth? It's interesting, I know a lot of journalists and you know, the journalist's vocation is to try and, try and get to the truth. That's, they don't always get there, but that's their vocation. It's also the vocation of pastors, Christians. The vocation of truth. Truth is a vocation for us in Jesus' teaching. It's a vocation for us. So how do we get back to that when we don't have the fairness doctrine to help us out? Please. I just would like to say to everybody here, all of us old people are here. We have to get the young folks out because they not only are the future, but there are a lot more of them and they are, we have, I am 79. Luckily, I happen to have a very politically active son, Jonathan Brostoff in Milwaukee. But you all have to get your next generation out. We're too, you know, we, we vote and we engage, but we have to get the next generation not to be so cynical, to believe that they can be the change. And I just want to ask you all, because this is my point of view on politics, is you must talk to 10 people about this election. And you have to tell them to talk to 10 people. And you have to say, write it down, who you talk to. And you have to make sure that they are registered to vote. And then you have to make sure that their 10 people talk to 10 people who talk to 10 people who talk to 10 people and get them to the polls. Because in the end, there's only one thing that matters, is who gets to the polls. And Wisconsin is going to continue to be at the epicenter of this next election. It's always good to see young women still organizing. I'm sure you have. There you go. And I started well, you're still going. <laughs> yeah. On, on young people here. Now, people make a mistake that young people are apathetic. This is not true. They just don't see how this election will make any difference in their lives. They see things not changing, no matter who's elected for so long. We talked about that this afternoon. I was able to get, uh, so we're looking for influencers with young people, which is not always our churches or even young pastors who tell me they can't get to them either. So I was able to get Steph Curry, who's an influencer to young people, to do a video for us called Why Vote? Why Vote? and it's, it's on the Face United to Save Democracy website. But he lays it out, of, of, speaking to those young people, why vote? But they're not gonna come to us or come to our churches. We have to go to them. Go to them 
in their organizations in the streets because uh, they've got so much at stake. Everything's at stake. But they're so alienated from the whole political system, which we, uh, we have to understand that. And we gotta say, don't just keep saving the system. Help us transform this electoral system. It's needing a fundamental transformation. I mean, most countries that are democracies, uh, they have this thing where whoever wins the most votes <laughs> wins the election. <laughs> what a unique idea. And the book talks about how majoritarian democracy is deliberately undermined by our electoral system. And that's got to be changed. Thank you for being here. Um, I have a granddaughter who's now 20. And when she was in the Milwaukee Public Schools, I went to one of her graduations. She had two kids in her class, girls, that were wanting to transition into boys. I was surprised. She had a lesbian teacher. She had a Latino principal. She had um, children of other colors in her class. She was raised in a whole different world than I've been raised. And we need to, as Ms. Brostoff has to say, we need to find ways of getting those young people because when I look around here, I don't see a whole lot of young people. You know, we need to get them interested in politics because life is politics. And as you said, I see evil too. And he has orange hair. And <laughs> his followers, many of them, I also believe are evil. And when I think about, you know, the Nazis and how so many just followed uh, Hitler, you know, that's happening here. Some of us could join the League of Women Voters. Some of us could do that. There are probably half or more women here. Um, you know, there are opportunities out there to get the vote out, to mm -hmm. get people to register. So, you know, let's do that for ourselves and our children and our grandchildren. So, so a, couple of you, a couple of you have raised the 1930s. So I'm going to speak a bit to that. Um, I was at the Candler Theological Seminary at Emory uh, about a year and a half ago. And uh, we had a gathering of pastors, mostly from southern states, very broad group. And the black pastors, because of the environment, felt free uh, to speak their mind out won't speak, but black pastors often don't feel free to speak in ecumenical environments and tell the truth that they've, but they were that day, and most of these, these are all young pastors. The young white pastors uh, agreed with everything the black pastor said, but all they could talk about was risk, what they'd be risking. I'm a female pastor, I need the parsonage for my children. I'm afraid I would lose my church or lose my job or lose my pension risk. So pleading for truth from black pastors, the risk from white pastors. That's a conversation that is going deep in this country. And so in the conversation, one of them said, it feels like a Bonhoeffer moment. <laughs> Dietrich Bonhoeffer, this young, German Christian who helped to lead the confessing church in Germany. Um, he spent his last year in this country at Union Seminary before going back to Germany risking his life and he knew he was doing that. What most Bonhoeffer biographies don't tell you is that while he was at Union <laughs> for that year, every Sunday he went to Abyssinian Baptist Church probably the only white guy in the crowd. And yet Reggie Williams, a wonderful scholar on this, who I talk about in that section, uh, said 
black cheap, black preaching, black music, black worship, black litur liturgy, black discipleship helped shape the confessing church. It helped shape what he's doing. So they were saying, but he died. He was hung in the concentration camp two weeks before the Allies came. And I said, yeah. But do any of you remember the German pastors who were part of the German church that supported the rise of the Third Reich and Adolf Hitler? Can't remember, remember one. Here we are talking about Bonhoeffer now. And Bonhoeffer inspired the South African struggle, you know? And he lives on still in many of our lives. So it's a time for standing up like that. Uh, and the confessing church in Germany in this book, the last chapter is called The Remnant Church. The Remnant Church, which I think is possible. Because there is, and I'll just say, a minority, being honest, of white believers, particularly younger white believers, who want to break with things as they are and who are ready to join with black and brown leaders in the church to create literally a new American church. That's what we're talking about, not just confronting white Christian nationalism, but to create a whole new American church. And a lot of young people, I think, are ready to join up with that. I have a question up here in the balcony. <laughs> um, I first of all appreciate somebody who is not fearful to say the truth, so thank you very much for that. Um, I also feel that we need a change of mind and heart, and I'm just wondering what you think about the concept of there being um, one God uh, one religion, that all religions are part of the same religion, and one humanity, that all people are part, are God's children. Well, I agree we're all, we're all we are one humanity, uh, created by God to be uh, the equal children of God. But we have many faith traditions, and sometimes we get stuck in let's call it inner faith, which is trying to, what's the common denominator? And that often doesn't work, because we have different faith traditions that believe very different things. That's why I like multi-faith better than inner faith, where we can be who we are. I mean, this book was endorsed by Ibu Patel, who's a, a Muslim, and Jonah Pesner, who's a rabbi, and, and, uh, and on our phone calls about voter pr protection, we have rabbis and imams on the call. Uh, and so how do we, live into, live into the best of our own faith tra tradition, but always open, always open, uh, in, a, in a pluralistic democracy. It's got to include all of us in it. So one God, one people, but even in our division, even in our tribes. I, I love, I love, you know, Revelation, where at the end of history, I love this passage where, where all of, we're all standing before God, and it says, worshiping God in their own tongues and tribes. They didn't become one kind of assimilated group. They remained who they were. Their identity, their tribe, their who they were remains. God doesn't want to make us into some kind of, you know, amalgamated group, which in this country would, would be white dominated, <laughs> to be honest. But how can we, in our many tribes, worship God, speak to God, in our own languages, our tongues, our tribes, bring the tribes together is what multi-racial democracy is. And I think we have a chance to do that. In some ways, I don't, I don't Dennis, if you agree with this, but this challenge, this test, this crisis, gives us more of a chance than we had before to move on to a multiracial democracy. We were stuck. Incremental reforms, two steps forward, one step back. It wasn't working, right? 
if we win this battle for democracy, which is so much more than partisan, Republican, Democrat, this battle, we could open up a chance to do what all those young people really want to see, which is a genuine multiracial, multi-faith, and multi-generational society. Hello, hello. Right here. Um, out there. Up here? Me? Okay. <laughs> um, the, the, the comment about, um, you know, the, the, I guess, the demographics and, and, and getting more young people uh, involved in politics, I think, is well taken. But as someone who uh, is here, because I read about this uh, event in the bulletin sitting in the pews here last Sunday, um, I can tell you that you know, generally the audience here is very similar to the audience that's in these pews every Sunday. And the, you know, the, the bringing in young people is, is just as much of a problem there for the church. And as someone who's, I've lived around the country, I've lived in a lot of different cities while in the military and going to school and spent a lot of time looking for progressive churches in the cities that I lived in and frequently found that when I would identify an affirming congregation, a progressive church, it was also generally an older church that was struggling to bring in young people. And I, I just wonder, I, I look and I see a lot of these uh, young, right, conservative movements, um, and it seems like there is an intersection between conservative politics and, and so-called young Christians, but I don't always see that same intersection between progressive politics and, and, and really, to me, politics that align with my faith and, and young uh, progressives and, and the church there. And I guess as someone in your position uh, at Georgetown and, and surely uh, seeing a lot of bright young students uh, with, with strong uh, faith and progressive values, where do you think the solution is there for bringing more young progressives also into spiritual movements and not just Christian spiritual movements, but, but of all congregations? Great question. So. I asked my students, what is the fastest growing denomination in the country? And they guessed this or that or the other. And finally one of them says, oh, the none of the aboves. <laughs> Which is true. The fastest growing denomination is those who on religious affiliation surveys say they, they check none of the above. I'm none of the above. Now, if you make a mistake to think this is a secular group or an anti-God group. Most of the nuns, N-O-N-S-E, believe in God or something bigger than themselves. But they're searching, struggling because of what religion is saying and not saying and doing and not doing. That's, that's the issue. And um, I remember George when I first showed up, I said one day, I love the nuns. And this Catholic sister said, we love you too. <laughs> and then I said, well, I, I love you nuns as well. In fact, in the early days when I would go out to speak uh, of sojourners, I'd walk into an evangelical Christian college and auditorium and chapel. There'd be two rows of sisters sitting in the front row, full habit, full garb. I said, sisters, what are you doing here? Well, we're local, Jim. I said, I figured that, but why here, Jim? This is a very conservative place. I said, yeah, I know, that's kind of why I came. We thought somebody should have your back. <laughs> so I had nuns for bodyguards for many years, and that's who you want to have for your bodyguard. So I love those nuns with all my heart. But also, I love these nuns. And every, the final day of class, I'll just say this, uh, we talk about the class. And a number of them say things like, you know, I was a little nervous about religion in this class, and I don't want to shove down my throat. I didn't want to be proselytized. But I, but I wasn't. I didn't feel that way. And you brought it in to all of our conversations about all these topics, how it might add something or reflect or, or uh, go deeper with something. And they, said, they say things like, I never heard about the black church for this class. Or at Georgetown, I've never heard about Catholic social teaching before this class. 
They say, when you talk about that different kind of religion, frankly, I feel more drawn to something than I've ever felt before. So I'm pretty hopeful about the nuns. I love the nuns because I think they're asking and seeking. But here's what they're looking for. They're looking for authenticity and courage. You want to win young people over? That's what wins them over. Authenticity and courage. So if we act the way that we're talking about tonight, in these next several months and in this critical moment, I think you're going to find young people who want to engage with us. That's my, so I, I think the nuns are asking all the right questions. And I think uh, they're open. They're very open. Let's take two more questions, because I think we're already over time. Two more questions. What texts have influenced your views on abortion and reproductive rights? Well, the quick question, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, the two issues that came up again t today in our conversation that get put forward all the time uh, from the right um, usually, uh, our, our abortion or same-sex marriage. So I, uh, on the latter, I say, always start by saying something like, LGBTQ are initials that all stand for those who are beloved of God. So we'll start there with that fundamental commitment and then talk about all the differences that there are. Uh, I'm a Pope Francis fan, um, and he doesn't like single issue voting. And he would talk, as others have before him, about a more consistent ethic of life, where life issues also include poverty, nuclear weapons that we worked on for years, and there's no narrowing of, of, of the issue. We live in a democracy when people are gonna bring their values to um, uh, public life. But we've been taken over by, by an extreme, by extreme voices and people, powerful people on these issues. And uh, most people don't believe what the extremes believe. Most people wanna find some way to go forward with disagreements, but there's there's some ways forward that are possible, but the extremes don't let happen. So I think even on those tough issues, which are tough issues, people have such strong views on all sides. I think, uh, you know, to, to affirm uh, that all of us are God's children and that Easter always strikes me <laughs> as it was the women who, went to the tomb, and all the men were hiding. They're all hiding. And it was women who were at the cross, at the end with him, when all the men had disappeared and were denying him. And women showed up to, to put s spices, and, and they said, I wonder what we'll do with that big stone. <laughs> and, they, and there was, stone was put away. Walk, and they walked in, here's this, this uh, young angel voice saying, he's not here, he's risen. And Mary Magdalene, who I just think is terrific, was in the garden and she thought she was seeing a gardener. She said, he said, what's the matter? I, I don't know where they've laid, where they've laid my Jesus. I don't know where he is. And he just said, Mary. That's all he said. Mary, he knew her name, and she heard his voice. And the role of women in the early church was so much different than the role of women in our churches today. And so let's focus, like Jesus did, on the voice and the dignity uh, and the experience of women. And we gotta take that into all these debates about reproductive rights. So it's tough issues, but I think we can deal with these issues 
if we take away the extremes from the conversation. And don't be controlled by that. So it isn't but it's a very so tough dark. issue. One last question. He hello. Um, I, um, I'm, a, I'm, a, 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 I'm back Where here. Where are you? How do you do? Um, hi there. Um, I'm, a, I'm a, a, a trans woman. I'm a, um, a Christian anarchist. Uh, found my way through that, uh, coming out of some of these uh, white nationalist spaces uh, about a decade ago, a little over a decade ago. Um, and, and I do think, um, I, I guess let's start with, with I, I think a lot of younger people are attracted to extremes. And unfortunately, what that looks like right now is younger people who are lost and finding themselves in religious circumstances or finding themselves attracted to uh, the young white, uh, where they're encouraged to be as radical and as, um, uh, at some points, participating in evil acts as possible. Um, but I, I, I do think that, um, I guess, I wrote it down. Um, I, I just have a lot of thoughts. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, so, uh, are, are you in a conversation, would you consider anyone, with anyone you would consider uh, to your left, uh, and as it learns to reckon with faith in its own communities? And um, I, I'm sorry that I, I'm not familiar with your previous book, uh, What the Right Doesn't Get in, uh, What the Left Doesn't Get. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm on my way. Um, in my conversation with people to the left, you're saying? Uh, yes. Um, so, oh, sure, uh, yeah. Where do you see like the furthest left in this faith conversation? Uh, you mentioned um, uh, What the Left Doesn't Get, or um, my colleagues to the left in, in, a, in a certain story you said earlier. Um, I, I understand that there's a reputation among like far left and perhaps notable writers on the left to say um, a lot of like atheist strain in there, um, but I do believe that that uh, in like anarchist and, and um, yeah, I guess like communist communities, whatever would yeah. be or the reckoning with faith now as a, a liberation movement in a way. Um, yeah. Are you in co these conversations? What are you hearing from people? I, I guess is where I'm at. Well, that's where I was during my my student days. I was. I was secular. I had rejected a religion. I wanted nothing to do with it. I mean, I had an elder in my church uh, took me aside and said, now son, uh, I hear you're going into Detroit, you're going into black churches and, and working alongside uh, young black men and all that, but you got to understand, I'll never forget, he said, Christianity has nothing to do with racism. That's political and our faith is personal. And I, in that conversation, that's the night that I left, in my head and my heart. This thing that was churning and turning me upside down, if that had nothing to do with Christianity, then I wanted nothing to do with it either. So I left it. And I didn't have words to go around that till much later, uh, which are these. Uh, God is personal, but never private. This is a God who knows every one of us and all our faults and frailties and, and wants a relationship with us anyway. It's never private, personal, not private. So I said to my colleagues on the left who understandably sometimes say the answer to bad religion is to get rid of it all, all together. I've said in my class, there are days when I feel that way, honestly, of what religion is saying and doing, that I can feel that way too. But ultimately, uh, I have come back to a faith that believes um, that, in my case, that Jesus can change lives and, and what he says can change all of us in our society. And I'm in constant conversation with colleagues, friends, students on the left, whether they're anarchist, Marcus, you know, Marxist or whatever, you know, LGBT, trans, all of that. Uh, because we gotta have that conversation. Because there's a reason why people uh, don't want anything to do with our faith, given what our faith often does or doesn't do or says or doesn't say. So uh, if we're not in those conversations with everybody, uh, we're in trouble because we don't see these things. Sometimes those critics um, see things in us better than we do. 
their critique of us in religion is often just what I felt over all those years. I wouldn't go near it, you know. And I had to, I had to be there, and then for me it was coming back to Jesus, not coming back to the church or Christianity. For it took me a long time to even say Christian I was a follower of Jesus. That's what I came back to. And so Jesus had conversations with everybody. <laughs> he had these conversations all the time. Imagine who he'd be talking to today. Uh, he'd be on the margins, on the streets. Uh, that's who he'd be talking to. I'll tell you one quick story. Uh, this is my text that brought me back to Christ uh, in Matthew 25. So I'm preaching on Matthew 25 in a conservative Christian college where the chaplain asked me to come to provide something different than what the students normally hear. <laughs> so, so I got up there and, and I preached Matthew 25, you know, and the students were very responsive and the faculty was too, but not so much the donors and board members. <laughs> and my new chaplain friend got fired because of what I did. Well, he brought me in, he got fired. Three kids. They didn't even talk to me. said, you're fired, right? You're changing the politics. And so I felt terrible, I got this guy fired. <laughs> so I'm in touch with him, how you doing? Well, how can I help? You know, and uh, finally one, one day he said, I want you to stop apologizing for getting me fired because I suddenly had time on my hands. And I was driving under this bridge, which I always drove under for years. And there were homeless people under the bridge, lots of them. But I never stopped. I never stopped to talk or meet anybody. Now I got time, so I stopped. And I talked. And I kept going back. And I would say, do any of you go to church? Well, I used to, but I couldn't go anymore the way I looked and everything, they wouldn't want me in. Uh, would you like to, well, yeah, but I didn't. You know. So after months of conversation, they started a church under the bridge. And he was the pastor of the church under the bridge. And he said, um, so what you said in that sermon, you said, the closer we get to the margins and the edges, the closer we get to Jesus. That's what you preached, got me fired for. But I have never felt closer to Jesus in my whole career as a minister than I feel now as pastor of the church under the bridge. So he got set free, you know. So that's where we, we belong. We belong uh, on the streets where, um, where I, I know where Jesus would be. He would be on the streets of Ferguson or wherever was going on. So I'm just saying to you, um, don't be ashamed of your faith. Don't be embarrassed by your faith. Don't be even skeptical of your faith. It's time to make our faith known, to bring our faith out, to speak it, and particularly speak it uh, in white churches where it needs to be spoken. Because so much is at stake. This isn't just an election. This is a culmination, a crescendo of America's original sin. And the reason they're fighting so hard is they know they're in trouble. So let's bring our faith to bear, believing that my two cents and your two cents be taken by a God who multiplies the value of all of our two cents. Let's offer all of our two senses to this and trust God for what might happen. Um, I beg your time. Um, 
I grew up in an extremely authoritarian family where bullying and abuse were the order of the day. And I see so much of what was going on in my family as to what is going on with the po white power right now. And I can tell you, these people were never loved or cared for. The only thing that they were taught that mattered was power and control. And somehow that needs to be taken into consideration when all of these conversations take place because that is all they know. They don't know about caring. They don't know what the verses in the Bible, what Jesus said. They have no idea how to relate to that. And somehow that needs to be taken into consideration when we're con trying to figure out how and what to do about all of this. So I'm sorry, thank you for your time. So we always like to uh, end one of these events with a, a call to action. And I think we've already been hearing it, but um, I'd like to offer one. Uh, when we're faced with an ideology like white Christian nationalism, it's easy to wring our hands in despair. Um, but we also, what we need to do is to get our courage going and to act. And we've talked tonight about how to do that. And one is to speak out. Um, to get informed and to have those conversations with people that we know um, in a very respectful and loving way. The second is to get involved. Uh, we've talked tonight about the We All Belong campaign, but there are others. Donate, get involved with them, attend their events, um, get in, you know, talk them up. And finally, get out to vote. We have got to prevail in national, state, and local elections if we're going to ever defeat white Christian nationalism. So there are many ways in which we can act. So whatever way that you do it, please get out there and fight for your faith and fight for our democracy. Thank you very much for coming. We have a reception outside, so um, please go out there and have some food. And you'll also be able to buy this book that I'm so ready to read um, and uh, to meet uh, and talk personally with Jim Wallace and have him sign your book. Thank you. This ends our evening. Thank you so much for coming.